All right. Hello, everyone. This is another episode of Fire Breathing Rob. If you're listening to us on the YouTube channel, thanks so much. Please like and subscribe. If you're listening to us on the radio, thanks so much. We have a special guest here, someone that I'm very fond of. This is Dr. Robert Watson. He's a professor of American Studies at Lynn University. He's authored over 40 books and written in many publications. And he's won Professor of the Year many, many times because he's one of the best uh, teachers I ever had. And I know many students will say that. So Dr. Watson, thanks so much for coming back on the program. Greatly appreciate it. It's a pleasure again, Rob, and I'm very proud of you for what you're doing. And it's always a pleasure to uh, chat with you in these programs. All right, Doc. So let's get in the thick of things right now. Uh, what is your opinion on the federal response and also the state of Florida response for the coronavirus? I think it's, it's unforgivable. It's uh, historically bad. Um, really, you have to go back decades and decades, if not, uh, you know, centuries before you find a leader mishandling something uh, to this extent. Um, the president has lied openly about the virus. He gives mixed messages inside of an hour or two. Uh, they can't even provide enough masks, uh, surgical equipment, gowns, uh, gloves to first responders to hospitals. Um, they haven't been able to get production up for uh, testing. Um, the standards aren't in place. Uh, you know, uh, good God, um, you federalize and get the army out uh, doing things. You get the National Guard. Uh, you move heaven and earth. Uh, on top of all of that, he has fired, Trump has fired inspectors general, whistleblowers, and anyone who's tried to shine some light on this, um, he has limited congressional oversight uh, to this disastrous response. Um, a year or two ago, they eliminated a uh, infectious disease uh, program within the federal government. Uh, just a year before this, they cut funding for certain types of housing assistance for the poor and other programs that could come into play right now. You know, quite frankly, uh, they've done nothing right. Uh, it's hard to name one thing they have done right to the point where I think uh, his press conferences and federal comments on all this uh, are just making matters worse. If I may quickly provide an example. If you go back and you look at, let's say, the Spanish influenza mm -hmm. in 1918 and 1919, which killed, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world, including many in the U.S., what we saw was Woodrow Wilson, the president, mishandled this in almost every way. Almost as bad, not as, but almost as bad as Trump. They limited uh, access to information. They hired incompetent people. Uh, they fired anybody that threatened to, to tell the truth about it. Uh, they gave mixed messages. Uh, they didn't prioritize production and mandating masks and other things. So they mishandled it in every way. Right. Consequently, if you look at Franklin Roosevelt's handling of the Great Depression, that economic crisis, don't forget Trump needs to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We not only have a healthcare crisis, we have an economic crisis, and he's grotesquely mishandling both. If you look at FDR, good God, in 100 days, 100 days of taking the oath, he moved heaven and earth. There were agricultural adjustments, relief for farmers, jobs creation programs, bailing out the banks, uh, comprehensive infrastructure programs, shovel-ready programs for the unemployed. It's a remarkable uh, uh, legacy that FDR has. Right after the Great Depression, uh, what you find is during World War II, look at Harry Truman's leadership of the Truman Committee, which was oversight on the war. Truman saved the United States, it's estimated, between 10 and 15 billion, with a B, dollars. That's uh, more than we spent on the Marshall Plan. Um, and he saved that by looking into grotesque cost overruns, inefficiencies, waste, fraud, abuse. He made sure people had food, the military had equipment, people were being paid. So we have examples in history of what not to do. We have examples in history of what to do in similar situations. And Trump is rewriting the textbooks on how not to do anything. 
you know, I don't blame this fully on Ron DeSantis, even though I think he's done a terrible job as far as the state concerns, concerns rather with the coronavirus. But I think this goes back to Rick Scott. And we look at what he did to unemployment throughout his time as governor, screwing it up so bad that people made, and he made it extremely hard for people to apply and get that. Yeah. Uh, so do you think it goes back there also to Rick Scott? I'd take it back to Jeb Bush, um, okay. yeah, who also made it very difficult. We've had uh, three governors who grotesquely mishandled this. Not only did they mishandle it, uh, unemployment, anti-poverty, uh, a, a, a social and, and economic safety net for the people of Florida. None of those were priorities of Jeb Bush, Rick Scott, or, or Ron DeSantis. Let's take it a step further. We've had for years now Republican-controlled state legislature who has gutted all these programs. They've derailed reform efforts. And this is sort of a perfect storm, Rob. We've seen for years they've been dismantling the infrastructure, the institutions, the processes we need to take care of people. Moreover, they have not only failed to prioritize it, they have, you could argue, declared war on the poor. Uh, and unemployed in this state. And consequently, here we are, we have a major crisis and uh, you have countless thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Floridians that they're losing the paperwork. They haven't cut the checks yet. It's backlog. There's, uh, you know, mixed, mess mixed messages coming out of government agencies. The system's crashing. The phones are busy. Um, you know, I don't know, and I'm trying to not be so dang critical, but this is life and death. Um, and if we don't, you know, call it the way it is now, when are we going to do that? I don't think that anyone can say that this governor has been out front of any of these issues. Um, he, like the president, has offered mixed messages on reopening masks, the beaches, mixed messages for businesses reopening. Uh, they have not prioritized unemployment. And I think what we have, Rob, is we have a lesson. And it's something I've always said, and you've heard me say this since as long as you've known me, leadership matters. You put the right person in office, they move heaven and earth, and people are getting unemployment. People are safer. Hospitals and first responders uh, are getting the equipment that they need. You put the wrong people in office, and what do they do? They politicize it. They blame others. They avoid responsibility. Could you imagine, take DeSantis or Trump, could you imagine someone like Harry Truman saying Washington trying to blame his critics and sidestepping leadership. Could you imagine Abraham Lincoln failing to be empathetic with the people that are suffering through this? It's, it, you know, this is a, a, possibly a new low in American history and we have to realize that. And, and uh, we, you know, it's, it's no longer a partisan, you know, issue. It, it's life and death. Uh, it's economic security for the people of this state and around the country. And enough is enough. We got to call it the way it is. Doc, can we speak about what's going on in Palm Beach County? We see that they're going to open up uh, the majority of the state within the next uh, week. Uh, but we also look at Palm Beach County. Now, the mo majority of Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade is not going to be opened up. You're in the heart of things in Palm Beach County. Can you speak on what's going on there, Doc? Yeah, of course we're not ready to open. Um, you know, the county, like the state, like the nation, has only tested a fraction of a percent, or in some places, as much as just 2% of the population. How do you reopen vital services when you don't even have testing? Secondly, we don't have tracking. Uh, not only do we not have testing, we don't have tracking. We have to track the people that have it. Um, we don't have widely agreed upon protocols for all these areas. There are so many questions, Rob. If I'm an employee and I don't wanna go back to work, can my employer fire me if I don't go back to work because I don't feel safe? Can I sue my employer? Um, what if I contract something while I'm at work? Is the employer liable? If somebody shows up without a mask, can they, de can they decline service? If someone shows up without gloves or sneezing, can they decline service? What's the role of the police? Uh, you, you know, we don't have the procedures or protocols in place. We don't even have the testing or tracking in place. And, and, and the other thing on that is I disagree completely with the governor and how he defines essential services and essential businesses. You know, there's talk uh, all around the county and all around the state by people of certain political persuasions of opening everything from bars to restaurants to tattoo parlors to getting a haircut. 
you know, um, I'm, I haven't gotten a haircut since this started, and I shave yeah. once a week Same. to save a razor. The world's not going to be worse off if I don't cut my hair and shave. These are not essential services. Um, on the other hand, you know, look at it. You, anybody that's working minimum wage or retail, they've either lost their jobs or they're going bankrupt right now. Thousands and thousands of Floridians cannot pay this month's rent, cannot pay their car payment, their electricity, their phone payment, and yet the federal government still hasn't gotten checks out. And once they get these minuscule checks, that'll cover one month, then we're back in it in June. And every day Pence and Trump say, oh, we're cutting them tomorrow. Mnuchin says, oh, it'll be any minute now, any hour. Here, you know, they've been saying it for two months. Um, Realtors are losing their tails, uh, the people that own these uh, establishments. Uh, a lot of these businesses are closing and aren't going to reopen. We've got to put money in the pockets of the businesses, put money in the pockets of the people. This is what you have a government for in times of crisis like this. So we're not ready, Rob, on any level to reopen. And believe me, I, f I want to reopen as much as anyone. I feel horrible for businesses and individuals that are losing things. Things. We're suffering in my household. We, I have two tuitions to pay, and our income has probably been cut by just about 50% because of this. So we're making sacrifices. I feel horrible. I just feel blessed to have a job. I feel horrible about all these people that are losing their jobs. But the answer is not willy-nilly, without testing, without tracking, without proper protocols, to just say reopen. That's not the answer. Well, Doc, it's, it's you even look at where I'm at in Central Florida. That's the hub of tourism. You look at Disney Universal, Busch Garden, SeaWorld, all the jobs there. That's probably over probably 200,000 jobs with all those parks. And, you know, nobody's working. All those people you said are making 10 to $15 an hour. They're not going to be able to afford rent. You know, Orlando's especially hard hit, as you correctly noted. It's yeah. a tourist-based economy. And a good percentage of the people in that county, in that region, work at SeaWorld, Disney, Universal, one of the parks, or the hotels, or if right. not, they work in the service industries, like restaurants and right. food catering and events that, that support all those industries. So it's a vibrant area when the economy is strong because it generates hundreds of thousands of jobs and it's jam-packed, bustling 24-7, 365, but my God, it's being hard hit now. And you have a domino effect, Rob, all these tens, if not hundreds of thousands of, of people that work at the parks and in service, they're not, as you correctly noted, they're not going to be able to pay their car payment or their rent, which means all those people that are in finance, auto dealerships, that own rental property, they're not going to get their payment. They still have to pay. What are they going to do? We don't have any plans in place for that. So I, I feel terrible about what's happening uh, in Orlando, and it's just going to continue this domino effect. Um, and, I, you know, we don't, you know, you just can't snap your fingers and reopen the Magic Kingdom. Uh, that's going to be rather, do you think that the economic recession in 2008 will be about the same as what's going to go on now? Or do you think what, right now it's going to be worse? Because, you know, not only just the illness and the health care costs that wasn't in 2008, but also, you know, with the foreclosure, there's going to be a foreclosure crisis again because people don't have jobs. They don't have any money to, you know, pay no the question. rents, pay yeah. health care. Well, I'm in agreement with most economists who have been saying that, I mean, and, and, and this is not meant to sound flippant, the 2008 you know, eight economic recession was terrible. It was the worst economic hit since the Great Depression, and, and people lost livelihoods, uh, lost businesses, everyone felt it, and, and, and countless millions of Americans suffered. Um, but uh, that's going to be a walk in the park uh, compared to this one. Uh, most economists are saying that we're in Great Depression uh, territory with this one. The unemployment rates during 2008 went to double digits. Uh, we could see this thing blow past 20%. Um, plus, you know, in 2008, as bad as it was, uh, as you looked at Obama's stimulus, there were shovel-ready infrastructure jobs ready to go. We can't just necessarily get people out working because we have this health crisis. 2008 was one crisis. We have multiple crises today going on. Um, George W. Bush colossally mishandled 2008, and that's a broad bipartisan agreement on that. I, I, you can't find anybody, even under a rock, that thinks that George W. Bush or the Republicans handled that well. All we have to do is go back and look at, you know, the auto rescue, the bank rescue, TARP, the stimulus. Not a single Republican voted for any of those, and they tried to uh, – 
derail them. And all that brought our economy back. But George W. Bush's mishandling of 2008 was just incompetence. Trump adds a level of maliciousness to his incompetence that so far transcends but you know, say what one will about George W. Bush, he was not a malicious person. He just wasn't that sharp. And uh, I think he had got bad advice, uh, was not an inquisitive person, was not a reader, was in over his head. But Trump has a, uh, you know, a dumb, malicious, uh, you know, uh, narcissistic side to him that is simply making this worse and worse and worse. So uh, we haven't hit the bottom yet, Rob. And I feel terrible about this and I'm alarmed. I have children, um, you know, I've invested in my career. I, I feel it every day because I have students the same way I, it bothered me in 08 because I had students like you that I, I liked and wanted to support. You know, what are our college students now? They don't get to go to graduation uh, this coming weekend. Um, think of those that were in athletics, uh, Lynn University's yeah. golf team, uh, women's tennis. They were looking at possibly winning the national championship. Yeah. The whole thing was canceled. They don't get another shot at that, especially if they're seniors. Um, students uh, from my son, uh, he's a college student, to, uh, students at Lynn, they, um, they had internships lined up. And a lot of them are losing internships. Some had study abroad opportunities. And of course, as you well know, uh, what you learn in the classroom or read from a book is only a small fraction of the utility of college. Those social friendships, interactions with professors, all the concerts and plays and, and VIPs that come to the campus, they're missing out on all that during these formative years. So as, as horrible as it was for you in 08, uh, it's, it's significantly worse for the students today. And I feel terrible for them. Doc, can you give a quick prediction? When do you think this will end? Oh, you know, <laughs> no time soon is all I could say. It would be, it would be um, uh, you know, irresponsible of me to try to do it. I'm not a medical professional. And no one knows, as Fauci has said, if this thing is going to mutate in the fall. The flu, uh, yeah. We don't know if we build up enough antibodies and immunity to this, or can we contract it again? This fall, we'll have our usual flu season. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, this administration hasn't even been able to get enough flu vaccinations in a regular flu season. So even if we get a vaccination program, I don't know that anyone can trust Trump and Pence. You know, Pence believes the earth is 6,000 years old. You know, I mean, geez, I, I, don't, I don't think anybody has confidence that these guys are going to handle this the way a John F. Kennedy, uh, you know, handled the, you know, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis or the space program, the way Truman handled NATO or the Marshall Plan, the way FDR handled the war, the way Lincoln, you know, no one has confidence in these guys. We need to remember uh, that they're not even able to get enough masks. How the hell are they going to get enough vaccinations and pay for them? And, you know, who, who gets them first? We haven't even thought about any of these scenarios that are coming down. We need to remember that this is a president who makes fun of the disabled, yeah. This is a president who's made fun of gold star families who have yeah. buried uh, children who have served with valor. This is a president uh, who has uh, bragged and boasted about molesting women and young girls. Uh, this is a president who separates children from their families and locks them in cages. Uh, this is a president uh, who, you know, and the list goes on. Yeah. Um, and, and, and he laughs about it. And his members of his party in Congress clap or at best remain silent about it. So there's a, a logistical aspect to all this, Rob. There's an economic, there's a public health aspect, but I think the common denominator of all that we're looking for right now, all that we're looking at right now, there's a moral dimension to our, our lack of leadership. There's a moral dimension. And, and I don't think anybody is confident that, confidence that this you know, guy that lacks empathy and is such a narcissist is gonna have the kind of empathy uh, to make sure that we all weather this storm um, together. Yeah, we just saw in, on March 31st, the Trump administration rolled back the Obama efficiency standard. How do you feel that's gonna affect the environment now? You know, um, this president has not mishandled one policy issue. He's mishandled everything he's touched. You know, as many commentators have said in some of the books written about him, everything this guy touches is destroyed. Uh, you know, it's the kiss of death. Uh, this president has weakened clean air, uh, clean water regulations. Uh, he says climate change is a hoax, doesn't believe in science, doesn't believe in evolution. 
has made fun of the idea of vaccinating children so that they don't get a disease. Uh, it, you know, it's not one thing, it's many. Uh, you know, we unilaterally withdrew from the Paris Climate Accords, which had the whole world working together uh, on this. We unilaterally withdrew from um, UNICEF uh, and the United Nations uh, Human Rights Campaign, uh, you know, uh, Human uh, Rights Council rather, uh, UNESCO we've withdrawn from. We withdrew from the various protocols uh, where we were working with multiple countries like Japan, China, and others to try to keep our eye on Kim Jong-un in North Korea. We withdrew unilaterally for that. We withdrew unilaterally from the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which united around a dozen countries in the region, economically, militarily, politically, to try to stand up against China's expansionism. Uh, we withdrew unilaterally from the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, you know, I mean, and we could spend the whole next five weeks just ticking off things that this guy has done like this. And the kicker is, in order to solve climate change, in order to deal with the prospects of a nuclear Iran, to get North Korea under control, to balance the playing field with powers like China, we've got to be internationally minded. These are global questions. We need U.S. leadership. We are going isolationist unilateral, we've withdrawn, we've abdicated our leadership role uh, to the benefit of Putin and China. Um, so at a time when we need more cooperation and internationalism, tragically, we have someone in office who's gone the exact opposite way. And it's not just on COVID and this economic crisis or climate change, it's on everything. Um, it, it's, you know, I, some days, you know, you wake up and I say, is this real? You know, or am I in a nightmare for the last couple of years? It's shocking. Doc, doesn't this pandemic, uh, you know, prove that right now we need Medicare for all. We need a Green New Deal. We just spoke about the health care crisis that's going on. and It's going to keep going on for months, maybe years. The Green New Deal, we talk about these uh, green energy policies that we need in this country because we just spoke about the storms all up in the, in the east and also in the south with the tornadoes that keep hitting Tennessee and other states uh, day after day. So with that being said, isn't this the time for progressive policies that we need at this moment? Of course it is. You're spot on. Uh, go back and think of, let's say, the Marshall Plan after World War II. You have the threat of communism in Greece and Turkey and spreading across Europe. Europe's on its knees. The world's destabilized. And the United States rescues Europe, rebuilds through the Marshall Plan. If Trump was in office, that would not have happened. No one can tell me he would have supported that. If the current Republican Party in Congress was in office back then, they would have called it socialism or communism. It wouldn't have happened. The Marshall Plan wouldn't have happened, which is just you know alarming to, to think about. NATO, we had a definitive threat from Joe Stalin and the Soviet Union immediately after the war. Truman organized NATO, this great transatlantic alliance with our allies. If Trump was in office, there's no way we would have done that. He would have made fun of Europe. He would have backed out of it. Good gracious, this is the guy who kisses up to Vladimir Putin, one of the world's worst dictators, and seems to favor the Russians over the Americans. There's no one that can tell you that this guy would have put in place something like NATO. So we have these historical parallels. Today, if ever, uh, we have proven exactly your point. We need Medicare for everyone. We need health, universal health care. Look at how, how Italy and Spain and, I mean, all around the world, these countries are struggling with this, but they're more equipped to deal with it because at least people don't have to worry about going bankrupt. They can see a physician. Uh, we don't have that in the United States. Uh, and, and you're right with the parallel, the ana parallel analogy of, of the Green New Deal in the face of climate change. You know, um, if you think about NATO and the Marshall Plan, Trump would have made fun of those policies, uh, and yet NATO and the Marshall Plan saved Western civilization, saved Europe, kept the peace, uh, led to great unprecedented economic prosperity. The proof's in the pudding. Um, but if you even say we need a Marshall Plan on healthcare today, we need a Marshall Plan on climate change, we need a transatlantic alliance, that's antithetical to everything that this knee jerk, you know, narcissist is about. So it's, it's not going to happen. With the last few questions, I want to move to election 2020. Can you make the case for voting for Joe Biden this fall with the baggage of Anita Hill, also the crime bill, 
the war in Iraq, the bankruptcy bill, the Obama administration failures, and then there's also a lot of talk about the cognitive issues of Joe Biden. So what would you make to the case that people are that are very worried about all the issues that I just ran off to you, Doc? I think it's a false equivalency, Rob. Um, is Joe Biden perfect? Of course not. Was Barack Obama perfect? Of course not. You take an objective group of historians and they will tell you that Obama did a lot of good. He got a lot done, did a lot of good. On balance, no question. Uh, from the Paris Climate Accords to integrating the armed forces to reaching out to Asian allies to there's no to auto rescue the tarp the uh, the bank rescue this guy hell saved our economy did Obama make mistakes of course did George Washington make mistakes of course did Abraham Lincoln make mistakes of course they all made mistakes however the equivalency is this Biden has made some mistakes but you know 36 plus years or wherever in the United States Senate. He made a mis big mistake with Anita Hill, but his mm -hmm. voting record for 36 years is overwhelmingly clear. It's pro-woman, overwhelmingly. This man has cast hundreds of votes for women's issues, equal pay, anti-sexual harassment, and you can find two or three mistakes, but you can find two or 300 positive votes. Now, does that mean we forgiving those mistakes? I don't know. I like to look at the bigger picture and no one's perfect. So if someone voted 300 times for women and botched three, I say they're pro-woman and give them the benefit of the doubt. Ditto okay. with uh, uh, the Obama record. Now, the false equivalency. Biden said a couple of dumb things. Trump maliciously lies 10, 20 times a day. Um, you know, if I, if I uh, steal a, a quarter, that's bad, it's a crime. If, if you steal $10 million, I don't think we can say, hey, they both stole. If, if, if you go up and slap someone in the face and I go up and murder five people, we both assaulted people, but it's a false equivalency. Biden's not perfect, but I think it's undeniable. Biden uh, has reasonable judgment. He would surround himself with experienced people, which Trump didn't. He would surround himself with people that are capable uh, and represent the broad tapestry of the country. Trump has surrounded himself with unqualified, incompetent people who don't represent anything but Wall Street. Biden throughout his, here's something else that's undeniable about his 36 years in the Senate or whatever number it is. Yeah. Uh, he was often voted the, the most popular and best liked member of the Congress. Biden always reached out across the aisle. He was friends with everyone there. Biden is someone that would surround himself with a broad tapestry of ideas. He would listen to them, he'd engage them, he'd reach out to them. And you know, he hasn't aged well and he's lost clearly a few steps, but his base instinct of surrounding himself with good people and deferring to them is something that, that is to be said for that. You cannot say any of those things about Donald Trump. Agreed, uh, about Donald Trump, agree. Uh, can we talk though quickly about this, Doc? You know. The thing that gets to me is I, I agree that he did make the votes for women, but why won't he release the records from the University of Delaware with the uh, Tara Reid incident? You know, it's bad. And this is as a, as a liberal and somebody that's very far to the left, you know that I'm a Bernie Sanders Democrat. You know, you, you look at the people and we see the Republican politicians and Justice Kavanaugh, Donald Trump, he, they've done stuff to women, I agree. But when the shoe is on the other foot, on our side of the aisle, on the Democratic aisle with Tara Reid, all of a sudden no one believes that that's true. When there's significant, if, significant evidence that this is true, there's video evidence of Joe sniffing women's hair, young girls' hair, touching them in the uh, different places, inappropriate places. Tara Reid's mother called up Larry King live and said this stuff. Her brother, another friend came out, said this was true. But everybody says that it's not true. Why can't she get a fear hearing just like we gave uh, the woman that Justice Kavanaugh did stuff to uh, fear hearing. Yeah, so first off, I'm a feminist, and I think you need to take every woman's claims to heart. We need, they need to have their day in court. We need to listen to them. We need to give them all the benefit of the doubt. Uh, now, having said that, I have heard a lot of Democrats come on the radio, come on television, and say she, they want to hear her point. Uh, you know, there's some valid points she's making. So the Democratic Party, by and large, has been saying, yes, 
Uh, she's made some valid points. Now they need to go further with it. Whereas the Republican Party, day one before they ever heard anything, dug in and attacked. So the parties haven't, I don't think the Democrats have handled this the right way. I don't think Biden's handled it the right way, right. but I wouldn't say they're similar, not in, in a million years. Now, uh, there are talking about releasing a lot of documents from the University of Delaware. I think they should release everything. You're right. right. Um, but they are talking about releasing a lot, whereas Trump hasn't even released his taxes. Uh, there was nothing released through Kavanaugh. So um, again, uh, there's the false equivalency here. Uh, do I think that she deserves her day in court? Darn right. Does she deserve to be respected and take, given the benefit of the doubt? Darn right. Should Biden release everything? Absolutely. Should he? Uh, should he discuss this more and get and you know and and be a little more open? Of course he should. Uh, absolutely. And I'm not defending and forgiving him. I'm simply pointing out that if I have to make a vote this fall between Biden and Trump, I'm going to. I am disturbed about this this incident with Biden. I'm deeply disturbed. I have a daughter, I have a sister, I have a wife, I had a mother. Um, you know, I, I know you have a sister, you have a mother. Uh, of course, we should all be concerned about it. But, you know, and that's deeply disturbing to me. But what Donald Trump has done, it, it, I mean, he has been a predator, a hunter. Of the, you know, and, and I'll say one more thing as I got to run. I have a, a big program here in a few minutes. Um, again, don't misconstrue. I think she deserves her day in court. I think she deserves the benefit of the doubt. I'm inclined to believe her until there's overwhelming evidence to the opposite and to the contrary. And I think we, Biden needs to release everything and, 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 and come even cleaner. He has talked about it, but he needs to do more. Having said all that, I think Joe Biden has made a lot of mistakes in terms of just the way he interacts with people. And again, not to be misconstrued, but I met Joe Biden and talked to him for a while, several years ago. He came up and the first thing he did was grab me on the shoulders. He was like massaging my shoulders and, and then you know, shoving me around. And then he kind of laughed and said, oh, you're from Pennsylvania. And he punched me in the stomach. He was, <laughs> it was like a football coach hugging me. And, you know, and part of that you like about him, part of that worries you. Um, I think part of it, and again, psychoanalyzing his personality is what it is, but part of it is that syndrome that a lot of older men have. You know, you cringe if you're at a restaurant, you hear an old man call the waitress sweetie or honey, or if you hear a guy say, oh, do you have a boyfriend? Let me show you a picture of my handsome grandson, Rob. You know, it's, it's they're just out of touch. Now, that doesn't excuse them. Uh, but there's the difference between being out of touch and doing something wrong and Trump being a serial harasser, rapist, yeah. and a compulsive liar. I'm worried about all, the only good thing we can say in closing about all this, Rob, is now that, you know, pro athletes, corporate types, Harvey Weinstein's, Hollywood actors, every politician, now that these sexual scandals are just everywhere, let us hope that men learn the lesson. Let us hope that we finally get serious about dealing with sexual harassment and treating women, uh, here's your shocking thought for the day, equally. So uh, thank you, Rob. Doc, thanks so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Dr. Robert Keep Watson.